Hi, good morning, good afternoon. Um, thank you so much for joining us today to discuss improving access to high quality preschool lessons from five state mixed delivery systems. I'm Hannah Melnick, Senior Policy Advisor at the Learning Policy Institute. Um, and we are very excited to host this webinar uh, today with the National Institute for Early Education Research. We also have a wonderful group of co-sponsors, the Council of Chief State School Officers, National Association of State Leaders in Early Education, the National Association of State Boards of Education, and the National Conference of State Legislators. These organizations represent policymakers at many levels, showing how broadly important the issue of mixed delivery preschool is and how complex. So today I'm gonna to be starting with some very brief context setting, and then we'll have a research presentation from Karen Garver, who will share NEAR and LPI's recent report findings on five state mixed delivery preschool programs. Uh, next, we'll have a panel moderated by Libby Doggett with state leaders from three of our um, five case study states, Alabama, New Jersey, and West Virginia, to discuss their successes and challenges in setting up high quality preschool across settings. Um, we'll then have a panel with local leaders from these same states to talk about how state policies affect local implementation and then Barbara Chow from the Heising Simons Foundation will identify some common themes that we've heard throughout the webinar and we'll close. So first, um, why are we focused today on mixed delivery? By mixed delivery system, we mean a program that is offered in various settings, so including public schools, child care programs, and family child care homes. Um, and there are many benefits of a mixed delivery system. It can provide families with more options, allowing them to choose a setting that works best for their child and meets their cultural and linguistic preferences. It can support small businesses by providing public funding to child care programs and family child care homes that operate as businesses and provide a public good. And when states are expanding publicly funded preschool options, they can build on the capacity of existing early learning programs in the community many of which have been serving children and families for years. However, implementing a mixed delivery system raises several considerations for states. One is ensuring that children have access to high quality learning environments in all settings so that all options are good ones to choose. Another is making sure that they meet the needs of diverse providers with sufficient funding, training, and support since providers' needs vary greatly across settings. And a third is navigating a complex early childhood landscape in a way that minimizes unintended consequences. For example, impacts on programs that serve infants and toddlers, as well as preschoolers. So why are we discussing these questions now and why are we focused on state preschool mixed delivery? Uh, mixed delivery systems are already the status quo. Almost all states already offer state preschool in a mixed delivery system. But what's changed is that public preschool has lately achieved unprecedented public and political attention. In 2021, Congress introduced the Build Back Better Act, which included language to substantially expand federal funding for early learning. And while ultimately not successful, it would have earmarked funding to provide public preschool in a mixed delivery system. And in the absence of that federal legislation, many states are moving ahead in expanding state preschool. Notably, California has made preschool universal by 2025, um, serving over 300,000 children each year. And major expansions are also underway in other states. So we're really hoping that this webinar and the report upon which it's based will help state policymakers who are contemplating preschool expansions to ex ensure that they're building systems that are high quality and equitable for children and for providers. And we're also hoping that it'll be useful to researchers and advocates, since to date there has been a lack of research in this area. So now um, I'd like to hand it over to my colleague, Karen Garber, Early Childhood Policy Specialist at NEAR. Karen is the Principal Investigator of NEAR and LPI's recent study, and she herself has deep background in New Jersey's state preschool system as a former administrator. Karen. Sorry, I was still muted there. Thank you so much, Hannah. I'm really excited to be able to share some findings from our report where we outline key decision points for states to consider when developing or expanding public preschool programs within a mixed delivery context. 
particularly in areas like governance and quality, what we found is that there are key policy areas that states need to address, but also that there's more than one path to high quality mixed delivery preschool. I'm going to give you a brief overview of how we conducted our study, and then I'll talk you through some of the main points of the report before we move into our panel discussions. Now, as, as Hannah already mentioned, when we refer to mixed delivery in the report, we're talking about a system that includes preschool providers from a variety of different settings. And we use two primary categories to define, define provider types in the report. First, we refer to local education agencies or LEAs, which many states call school districts. And we also refer to non-LEA settings, which in the report includes Head Start agencies, child care centers, private schools, family child care homes, and some other less common places where children may be served, like in libraries or on college campuses. The, five, uh, the findings of our report are based on case studies we developed for five states, Michigan, New York, New Jersey, West Virginia, and Alabama. And we selected these five states because they all serve at least a third of their four-year-old population, they serve children in mixed delivery settings, and they meet at least seven of NEAR's 10 quality standards benchmarks, which means they have important policies in place to support quality. We also selected these states because they represent different approaches to mixed delivery in terms of governance, establishing and maintaining quality, and how funding flows to individual program providers. Our data came from several different sources. We pulled much of our information from NEAR's State of Preschool Yearbook, which is an annual survey of state preschool program administrators. The yearbook provided us with background data on each of these states, as well as an overview of the policies they have in place to support program quality across settings. Then we supplemented the yearbook survey data with a series of interviews with state preschool administrators to dig deeper into their policies and practices and also with a review of publicly available documents like state statutes, code, and guidance documents. And here's a bit more context on our case study states, showing the total number of children they serve, the percentage of four-year-olds served in public preschool, and the percent of slots being offered in non-LEA settings. You'll notice that New York and New Jersey serve the largest total number of children. And something interesting about New York we found is that 44% of public preschool children in New York State are actually served as part of New York City's Preschool for All program, which operates within a robust mixed delivery system. West Virginia is also an interesting case where over 80% of state preschool classrooms represent a collaboration between an LEA and a non-LEA. It's also the only state on this list that has reached a level of universal access to public preschool. Like most states, West Virginia is still recovering from pandemic-related enrollment declines, but was serving almost 70% of its four-year-olds pre-pandemic. The first set of questions we address in the report are about how programs are governed, and we examined policies around legislative requirements for mixed delivery, how contracting happens, and how funding flows. Legislative requirements can influence mixed delivery, and some states use this approach to signal the importance of non-LEA participation in public preschool systems by requiring mixed delivery. Our case study states represent a few different approaches. Michigan and New York set minimum, a minimum percentage of slots that are required to be offered in non-LEA settings. And as I mentioned earlier, West Virginia is a bit different, requiring that at least 50% of classrooms represent a collaboration between LEA and non-LEA providers. And in New Jersey's Abbott districts, LEAs are required by a state Supreme Court mandate to subcontract with all willing and able non-LEAs when space is needed to serve children. The way states set up their governance structures impacts how funding flows and also determines who's responsible for monitoring finances and providing support to improve quality. The case study states represent three different contracting structures. Alabama has the highest level of state involvement, where both LEAs and non-LEAs are allowed to apply directly to the state for contracts. In New Jersey and New York, by contrast, LEAs receive funding directly from the state and then subcontract with non-LEAs. Then in Michigan, state preschool funding is only granted to intermediary agencies, which then subcontract with both LEAs and non-LEAs. And in West Virginia, Funding is provided to county-based collaborative teams, which negotiate funding levels with LEA and non-LEA providers. When states are determining funding levels for public preschool, it's important to understand that those rates are likely to impact 
whether LEAs and non-LEAs are able to participate in the program. Some states develop rates that are customized to individual program needs, and others provide equal rates to all program providers. Alabama is unique because it's one of the only states in the nation that provides funding by classroom, which is then often tailored based on specific program needs. Our remaining case study states use a more traditional per child rate, but they each approach those rates differently. In Michigan, per child rates vary only by the length of day provided to children. And for one of New York State's programs, rates vary only by whether or not there's a certified teacher in the classroom. Then there's New Jersey, where rates vary based on where children are served, with the highest rate provided for slots in childcare settings, since they often operate with smaller economies of scale, and the lowest rate provided for slots in Head Start centers, since they braid state and federal funding to serve children. And West Virginia stands out as a state often highlighted for requiring programs to blend state preschool funding with all other available funding sources to ensure efficient use of all available funds. The second set of questions we address in the report are about how states support program quality through policies that address standards, teachers qual teacher qualifications, and instructional support. In order to support access to high quality preschool experiences in every type of setting, state policies need to be consistent across settings and our five case study states each meet that mark. They require both LEA and non-LEAs to follow state program standards addressing key domains of child development and offer support for providers to choose a curriculum and child assessments that are aligned to those standards. Then they require teachers in all settings to receive professional development that supports implementation of the state standards and is also aligned with the chosen curriculum and assessments. Each of the case study states also requires all classrooms to, to adhere to class size limits of no more than 20 children and to maintain a teacher-child ratio of no more than 10 children per adult, again, regardless of setting. Digging a bit deeper into requirements related to teaching staff, we know that research suggests teaching staff with specialized knowledge and training in early childhood education are generally associated with higher quality programs, again illustrating the importance of consistent policies for preschool teaching staff, regardless of setting. All five of our case study states require a bachelor's degree with early childhood education specialization for lead teachers in LEA and non-LEA settings. But a few of the states have some slight variations in how this is implemented. For example, in Alabama, the type of credential, license, or certification required for lead teachers in LEA settings is different from non-LEA settings. And in West Virginia, teachers in non-LEAs are provided with more than one option for fulfilling program certification requirements. In the report, we thought it was important to highlight the approach that New Jersey took in the early years of expanding the Abbott preschool program. As the program ramped up, uncertified teachers in non-LEA settings were given scholarship funding and up to six years to obtain a bachelor's degree and the P3 credential required to teach in state preschool classrooms. So in that way, the state recognized the important capacity these existing teachers brought to preschool expansion efforts. And finally, since compensation inequities between preschool and K-12 teachers are a significant challenge for recruiting and retaining state preschool teachers, the report highlights the importance of compensation parity policies across settings. New Jersey and Alabama both have policies in place requiring salary parity for state preschool teachers in all settings, but neither requires equal benefits for teachers in non-LEA settings. West Virginia supports salary parity for teachers in LEA settings, but state policy doesn't extend to teachers in non-LEA settings. In fact, there's not currently a state preschool program in the country that requires both salary and benefit parity for non-LEA teachers. The case study states also have similar requirements across settings to support instructional quality through coaching and professional development. But again, some of the states differ in how they implement these practices. For example, in Alabama, coaches are employees of the state, while in New Jersey, coaches are employed by LEAs but are required to provide coaching in all settings. And in Michigan, professional development and coaching are coordinated by the intermediary school district. Hopefully you saw through this very quick overview of our report that the states we studied have, have a lot of consistent policies in place to support mixed delivery, even though in some cases they take different approaches. With these policies and approaches in mind, the report outlines six actions states can take to support a strong mixed delivery system with consistent quality across settings. 
The first is to establish common program standards across settings so that all children receive high quality preschool experiences. As you saw, each of our case study states have high quality standards that are aligned across settings to ensure that families have access to quality preschool in a variety of different types of settings. The second is to address the barriers that might prevent non-LEA providers from participating in state preschool programs, specifically by providing them with information and resources to support their participation. The third action is to ensure that both LEA and non-LEA providers receive ongoing support to establish and maintain high quality learning environments through coaching and professional development that are embedded in a continuous quality improvement system. And again, as the report addresses, there are several different ways states can implement this practice. The fourth recommended action is for states to recognize that the cost of meeting high quality standards can vary across settings, and that it's important to ensure that program funding levels are established in a way that allows different kinds of providers to meet high quality standards, while also retaining qualified staff with appropriate compensation. The fifth recommended action is to establish a system for coordinated enrollment across mixed delivery settings, to ensure family choice and provider stability. States can play a role in ensuring that preschool options are clearly communicated to families and that enrollment processes are organized in a way that is efficient and equitable. And finally, the sixth recommended action is for states to collect data and conduct research to understand families' access to high quality preschool in different settings. Enrollment data that's disaggregated by program setting and child demographics can shed so much light on the extent to which children from different backgrounds and abilities have access to and are enrolling in different types of settings. The main goal of our study was to use case studies to highlight the critical policy decisions that influence how quality and access are supported within a mixed delivery system. My co-authors and I hope that states can use this information as they build or expand their own mixed delivery systems to provide more children with high quality early learning experiences. And with that, I'd like to introduce Libby Doggett, who is the moderator for our two wonderful panels. We are extremely lucky to have Libby here today as she's devoted more than 40 years to improving early education programs across the country at the local, state, and federal levels. Thank you so much for being here, Libby, and now I will turn it over to you. Great. Thank you, Karen. That was an excellent report. You packed a lot in, and I do urge everybody to download the report and read it. It is wonderful. Uh, I'm delighted to be here with this awesome set of panelists, the creators of the Mixed Delivery Case Study Report, and all of you. I love seeing old friends, and I'm heartened by all the awesome young leaders moving us forward today. Today's panelists will not be talking about the importance of mixed delivery system. We've already heard that and that's accepted practice. And we won't really discuss the urgency we all feel to build a zero to five or zero to eight system because that too is a widely accepted goal. But it will be about how leaders within and outside the system in three states have worked together to build some of the best mixed delivery systems program, pre-K programs really in the country. They're not done, they're not perfect, but they are moving quickly in the right direction and have a lot to teach us about state policy, implementation, and collaboration. So remove any distractions, hold on to your seat, because we're going to move fast and we're going to learn a lot. Our first panel, our state panel, features three of these awesome young leaders I was talking about. First, we have Janet Bach Hager. She is the coordinator of Universal Pre-K Steering Team at the West Virginia Department of Education. Then we'll hear from T Pamela Trulove Walker, who is the Senior Director of Early Learning and Early Education at the Alabama Department of Early Childhood Education. Note that's not the Department of Education, it's separate. And then a uh, third person on our uh, state panel is Robin Wilkins, the, she's the Education Program Development Specialist at the New Jersey Department of Education, and she's also our current president of the National Association of Leaders in Early Education. Uh, I'm delighted to have these great panelists with us, and with this, I'll proceed uh, with our questions. So my first question is for all of you, and you have two minutes. We have to be brief. To, to answer, and we'll, um, here's the question. What approach did your state take 
in crafting the legislation to establish a state preschool program? And how did the state agency support effective implementation at the local level? And we'll start first with Janet, and then with Robin, and then with Pamela. So Janet, the floor is yours. Thank you, Libby. So in West Virginia, it started two, it started more than two decades ago. Local agencies were already doing sort of a mixed delivery system, but it was a it was a hodgepodge and state legislators, or we call them pre-K champions two decades ago, passed legislation in the 11th hour of the last day of the legislative session that said universal pre-K will take place in West Virginia by the year, by the school year 2012, 2013. And in that, in that legislation, they dictated that um, it will be duly governed by our Department of Health and Human Resources and our Department of Education. And so we partner at the state level and model a collaboration at the state level as we want it at the local level. And you'll hear more about that from my local partner. Um, and as, as they did that, they pulled together a state level stakeholders team once the legislation was passed. And those stakeholders included those invested in early childhood. And out of that came our state pre-K policy. And um, it's, it's a riveting document that um, really does guide us as a state and our local level on what pre-K should look like. So counties had 10 years or LEAs with their partners had 10 years to build a system. And as they built a system, they had to um, submit an annual plan that has now shaped what each county collaborative early childhood team looks like to implement pre-K. And it included a needs assessment, um, program design, curriculum assessment, enrollment, and all of the big nuts and bolts um, to a high quality system. We also, um, in that policy, included high quality indicators. So. The legislation paved the way for the state policy, and the state policy is what guides us at the state level as we support the local levels in this in this process. Inside the legislation, it said that counties will collaborate with existing programs, and that was the big agent that drove our mixed delivery system. That's great. That 10 years was really, really critical to getting it set up. So Robin, we'd love to hear from you. Hi, everyone. So New Jersey's story began uh, really on a foundation from a 1998 Supreme Court mandate that established legislation now known as the Abbott Preschool Program. Um, and that preschool program is uh, built on um, high quality standards, along with child outcomes that are now 25 years or so um, going strong. Um, However, in recent times, and I would say since 2017, 2018, uh, our state is very quickly moving towards expanding um, preschool to more districts. And so this program is now called Preschool Expansion. Um, and actually New Jersey is really gearing up for um, a, a universal preschool rollout uh, very soon. One of the challenges that um, I would like to just share is how the Department of Education, which is given oversight over the state-funded preschool program, um, is going to um, continue the relationship between uh, local school districts, which were originally 31, to what we currently have, which is about 250, to the potential of 600 school districts. Um, and what we will be able to manage in terms of continuing those high quality uh, experiences for children, standards and, and those outcomes that we know are so important. Great, thank you. Pamela, you're last. Sorry about that, I couldn't get myself unmuted there for a minute. Um, so I think that is important to note that the, um, initial uh, code and all the work that was done to actually get um, pre-K into a uh, state code uh, really did involve uh, multiple prongs. And with that, uh, there was in-depth uh, reviews and 
uh, of early childhood research and child outcomes. And, and that was combined really with collective impact uh, and civic prosperity. So what, what was gonna be the ultimate return on the investment? And I think that began all the conversations uh, in the legislation around not only what was going to be established as uh, what we call first class pre-K here in our state, um, but also where it was going to be housed. Of course, the uh, Alabama um, State Department of Education uh, had long been in existence. And then we had the Department of Children's Affairs, which was then, uh, which has then been translated with the name change to the Alabama Department of Early Childhood Education. But I think one of the things that was uh, very important in establishing um, state-funded pre-K was the goal that there would be a slow incremental growth um, of what that pre-K establishment would be and that the investments would then follow uh, at that same pace. So what began with um, 54 classrooms and a $3.3 million investment uh, has evolved to current day to about 1,500 classrooms and over $152 million uh, invested. And that is with the goal that eventually our state would be able to reach 70% access. And 70% access um, was researched and it was determined that that would allow families who wanted state-funded pre-K an opportunity to be able to uh, access pre-K. And I will say that effective implementation at the local level, um, because we do actually go from state to local, uh, was really, uh, it really took a lot of partnerships uh, and outreach in order to make that happen. So there was a combination of state agencies and community organizations. Uh, and then we had key advocates like the Alabama School Readiness Alliance, and they were all instrumental in ensuring that the information and the implementation that was happening at the local level really had someone there to support um, the, the goals and the missions of what state-funded pre-K was designed to be. So those boots on the ground, the multiple prong approaches to how we were gonna do this were all key in what um, state-funded pre-K is today in our state. Wow, uh, you can see each state is so very, very different and each one has a different story, an amazing story and wonderful leaders right now that are actually on the backs of former leaders because I knew all those that got these uh, programs started years ago. So my next question is actually uh, to go a little bit further on governance and administration. And it's gonna be a little bit different for each panelist and each one will have two minutes. So Pamela, we're gonna start with you. Alabama was the only case study state that directly contracts with providers. You saw that in the slide earlier. Can you briefly share why your state took this approach and how direct contracting supports a high quality mixed delivery program? Yes, um, in our state, uh, it was viewed as the best approach because direct funding uh, to providers actually allows them to best identify where funds are needed. Um, so as they are able to establish their budgets in this mixed delivery model, um, then they're able to then say, these are our needs. And clearly the needs of, of an LEA are drastically different than the needs of a, a Head Start program or a, a private child care. Um, and then there's also lots of tremendous variability in our state in need based on geographic location. Uh, so what's available in rural areas versus what's available in um, suburban areas in just with the availability of, of child care. Uh, is tremendously different. So direct funding does allow our agency to better target access. So some areas of our state are comprised of a school district and maybe just one other licensed child care facility, while others have the availability of multiple child care options within a city block. Um, so direct funding also allows our department to actually then target funds as well to spaces and places that may need uh, additional uh, supports. It also allows us to target uh, where um, we provide additional resources and services, like are, is there a higher need for coaching in one particular part of the area of the state or based upon a, a mixed delivery system. So it really does allow us to kind of like get down to the root of um, what would be needed in order for uh, state funded pre-K to be successful in the mixed delivery system. It's obviously working in Alabama. So Janet, you're next. 
West Virginia set a benchmark that 50% of classrooms are collaborative with non-public providers. Can you share briefly how your state defines collaboration and why West Virginia chose to focus on partnerships by classroom rather than by setting? Sure. So I'm going to start with what collaboration is not. In West Virginia, collaboration is not a subcontracting of seats. So it's not about where you are. It's about the services and collaborative contracts. So um, as the, in West Virginia, as counties were building their systems, each brought to the table various resources. And the overarching goal is that families don't have to provide the most necessary service to them, but that they can access various services. For instance, you might have a classroom in a childcare center that is collaborative with Head Start and the LEA. School aid funding comes to that classroom, Head Start services are provided in that classroom, and they can have before and after school care through the child care center. So it, it's very dependent upon collaborative contracts that are signed and initiated every year. And so counties um, use this process to maximize the resources available to families. And this includes all four-year-olds and three-year-olds with IEPs. And it's very much um, dependent on the enrollment process. You have to have a countywide enrollment process. And that enrollment process helps place children where they need the services. So collaboration is equals joint decisions in West Virginia. Um, it's governed by each county team governs the composition of the classrooms and um, and how the services are provided. So that looks very different. It's not just a space for a child, but really how can we provide all those services and, and those contracts solidify that process. And we right. are at 82% collaboration in West Virginia. That's amazing. And you're serving so many of your kids in such a high quality program. It's a great story. Uh, and every child is eligible, which isn't always the case in many states. So Robin, uh, can you share why, why New Jersey has funding rates that are, reflect different costs by setting and how these rates are actually updated over time? Sure. So uh, as you referenced in the report and as Karen mentioned um, earlier, uh, we do have three um, county per pupil or per child rates, and they do vary by um, geographic region. So similar to what Alabama mentioned, um, but based on the setting, we wanted to allow for programs to um, develop budgets that were tailored to their unique needs and circumstances. So um, the highest rate does go to um, child care providers who are contracting with um, school districts. Um, the next highest rate would be the school districts themselves. Um, and then for Head Start programs, because the state funding is um, leveraged with the federal funding, the state per pupil rate is, the, is lower. But again, they are funded um, pretty much on an equal basis in terms of that, that available uh, allocation. Um, as I mentioned, these program, these districts are subcontracting with private providers, um, and they are going through a budgeting process with their contracted Head Starts and providers to, again, look at overall costs that will vary by those various settings. Um, one of the things I do want to just add is that over the years, there has been a cost of living um, allocation adjustment made to those um, regional um, county per pupil rates. However, one of the things that we are coming um, to learn is, of course, that the real costs of the program are not keeping up with the, um, the state dollars. And so one of the examples, I, well, I have two examples. Uh, one is the teacher parity, which I know we're going to talk about. Um, but, you know, as um, school district salaries rise, we are, we are trying to ensure that there's teacher parity in the contracted programs 
Um, and that might be the case for salaries, but not for benefits, which I know was mentioned earlier in the discussion. And so we do run the risk of, you know, the non-LEA teachers um, having comparable pay, but not having comparable benefits. And then the second thing I would say is that benefits, as we all know, our health benefits are rising. And so again, it's becoming much more of a challenge for programs um, to, uh, to keep up with those rising costs. So even some of the best programs are having trouble with parity around benefits, and that's all, all across the state, country. So the next question is, we really wanna look at the research. So from the research, I mean, from the research overview, we know that states in this study have consistent quality standards for LEAs and non-LEAs, programs in LEAs and programs in non-LEAs. State and local supports are critical though to ensure that teachers are well qualified and compensated and programs are provided resources for continuous quality improvement, which we know is critical. So each of you will have two minutes to respond. And Robin, I'm gonna start with you. New Jersey has invested in building a pipeline of qualified teachers in non-LEA settings. How has the pre P3 certification supported your efforts? What lessons can you share to build a pipeline of qualified teachers and assistant teachers in non-LEA settings? Well, as the Supreme Court mandate was coming down, uh, the preschool through grade three certification, I believe, was already uh, in existence. So this was not a big shift for um, district teachers um, to have a bachelor's degree in certification. It was um, something new, though, for the um, non-LEA, so for those child care providers um, and, and, and in many cases, Head Start. So what New Jersey did was to invest in um, scholarship funding for um, those non-LEA teachers um, to, uh, to obtain their bachelor's degrees and to get certification. Um, but then we started to see also that the time frame that the courts had um, required was um, coming to an end and we still had um, a sizable number of teachers in those non-LEA settings who had not just, they just hadn't had enough time. So the Department of Education went back to petition the court to get an extension and that was granted. Um, along with the scholarship funds though, is just the idea of having, um, working with an existing infrastructure through the Department of Human Services which is the uh, vehicle that was giving out the scholarships, but also to partner with our higher education folks to ensure that those two and four year institutions really had become that pipeline um, setting up programs across the state that would enable non-LEA teachers to um, attend classes and get, you know, their sort of get their bachelor's degrees, get certification. One last thing that I will mention that was also happening is that in some cases, we had teachers who were um, sometimes struggling just to meet the foundational requirements of a bachelor's um, program. And so there were additional supports built in to ensure that um, those teachers were still successful. Uh, so that, that pipeline of having P3 certification is a requirement now, it provides a requirement um, for all of the teachers in the state funded preschool program. I remember thinking it was a miracle you all got so many teachers in place so quickly and those supports of uh, time and uh, scholarship money were critical. So Pamela, Alabama has a commitment and requires salary parity for lead teachers in all settings, which is great. Can you tell us how you convince the legislature that the funding so to support salary parity, because it's expensive, was critical to supporting a mixed delivery system. Well, pay parity was important for multiple reasons, and I'll just kind of really focus on a couple of those. And one is quality. So as we are having conversations with multiple stakeholders, some with more awareness of early childhood best practices uh, than others, it was essential to note that teacher caregiver credentials do play a role in classroom quality. So if we were going to be asking for these teachers to have comparable degrees to those that are found in K-12, then we then uh, want comparable wages. 
Um, and so because our pre-K program does require the same or similar entry level um, teachers uh, as K-12, then why shouldn't they be compensated to that same degree? So that was something that um, we were very passionate about and continue to remain passionate about. Um, the other importance for pay parity is around elevating the profession. Pay parity helped with the conversation around pre-K teachers as professionals. They're not babysitters. They're not uh, child care workers uh, focused on health and, and sa safety, but we have uh, quality indicators and we have standards that are that are taught in these classrooms. And I think when individuals are then having those conversations about the wages for first class pre-K teachers, then they're going like this. Oh, and they're the same for K-12. There is no difference for us. Um, and I will add, these are conversations that we have annually because we are separate from um, the State Department of, of Education, uh, then we have to make sure that we're forever in front of our legislators and reminding them, hey, there was a 4% increase for uh, teachers in K-12. Don't forget about our 4% increases for our um, pre-K teachers. And so I think all of that together speaks to quality. It speaks to elevating the profession uh, and then individuals then realizing regardless of where individuals land in that mixed delivery system, whether or not you're in a child care center, a Head Start program, Program. Equal salaries is what we're wanting uh, because we have equal demand for quality and we have equal demand for uh, those credentials to support the work. Will you come to Texas and talk to some of our legislators? I'd love to see you take them on. <laughs> so Janet, you're the last one and then we're going to go to our, uh, to our audience and have some questions from them. West Virginia collects data from county collaboratives annually on aggregated child assessment and program quality. How do you use the data at the state level to monitor quality and report to the state board and the legislature how your program is ensuring program quality and resulting, most importantly, in success for kids? Sure. So, I mean, we collect more than that as far as um, data. And what we, you know, as our state team supports the local teams, we say, how, how are you making decisions about professional development? How are you making big decisions for your program? You use data. So we collect that data in addition to our pre-K program review process that we conduct with all of our counties at a minimum of once every three years. We pull all that data together and then we determine through our system of support that we use in the state. Um, and that system of support really does pull in those county collaborative early childhood teams um, on a regular basis to ensure that they're getting support in the areas that they need. So we look at those data pieces as a state team, consult with the, the local teams, and then we, we provide professional learning for those local teams on a regular basis. Um, Sarah and I are actually at our uh, spring meeting for our pre-K teams in the South for West Virginia today. And so it's an ongoing process based on data that we collect from the local levels. And we look for trends to see where we need to go, um, what we need to focus on. Is it instructional supports in the classrooms post COVID? Is it structures for county collaborative teams and, and enrollment processes, because they have a lot of requirements in the state pre-K policy that they have to meet as a team. And, and that's our focus always, using that data to give them relevant support. Great, thank you. You all are awesome. So we have a little bit of time left for some questions from our audience and I have some good ones here. So Pamela, what about the infant and toddler teachers in the system? I said we weren't going to talk about that because it's, but we, we you have a question, so you get to talk. Yeah, so uh, we've done a couple of things because we uh, also are very uh, passionate about elevating the profession uh, as a profession uh, for our agency, birth through age eight, right? Uh, and so we were uh, fortunate enough to actually receive PDG funding. And so with those PDG funds, we did just that. We took uh, classrooms that we call first class foundations uh, sites and said, hey, if you guys are going to then go through the process with us of 
uh, implementing these standards and um, ensuring that, you know, there is an elevation of what happens in those classrooms, then this is how we'll be able to support you in, uh, in that work. And we then uh, uh, provided pay parity for those uh, teachers that were a part of first class foundations as well. So our infant toddler teachers are also making uh, with comparable degrees, they're also making that. But there's a limit to that because of course that's in those first class foundation sites. Um, but we also did, we make that a part of our apprenticeship. Uh, so we have a, a educator of apprenticeship that is, uh, we're the sponsor. And so individuals who come into that apprenticeship model, pay parity is embedded with that as well. So we do have infant and toddler teachers who are not part of first class foundations, but are in Head Start programs. We have them even in part of our school system they're also at pay parity. So I'm always delighted when I'm able to tell people that there's an infant toddler, that we have infant toddler teachers in our state whose salaries are comparable to um, that of, of K-12. Um, and so we just continue that process, continue to have those conversations, continue to request funding uh, for that. Uh, and so I'm of the mind that it eventually will get there. Wow, Alabama is becoming more and more impressive every day. So I have one question I would love to hear from uh, our other two panelists about this. How can have your, has your state ensured that one provider type doesn't dominate the system? And Janet, will you go first? Sure. So I'd mentioned a couple of times these local collaborative teams. There's a required core team in West Virginia at each county, and it includes a designated pre-K coordinator, a designated preschool special needs coordinator, to be the voice for children with disabilities, a Head Start representative and a child care representative. Those are the people who make the core decisions county by county in West Virginia. We do have some um, child care places that don't have child care um, there in, in some of our counties. And in that case, the Department of Health and Human Resources is required to provide a representative on that team. Those team that team makes decisions. You can't even open a, a superintendent can't even open or close a classroom without that core team making that decision. So that core team is is a very powerful entity, but it it includes all four voices. Great. And Robin, how about in your state? Um, that's actually a really interesting question. So, I mean, what I would say, and I didn't get to mention this earlier, is that, you know, our mixed delivery system is firmly in place for those 31 Abbott districts that was part of the Supreme Court mandate. Um, so there is definitely a higher percentage of those districts contracting out with um, centers, childcare programs, and Head Starts, but not so much in these um, districts that are part of preschool expansion. Although the Department of education does incentivize it um, through an application process or a competitive you know, process. Um, but what I would say is that we are working very hard in partnership with um, the Department of Children and Families, which is where licensed child care exists in our state, and the Department of Human Services with subsidized child care to ensure that school districts understand the value and benefits of contracting with programs so that it is not seen as um, I'll just say something tribal where it's an us versus them. We want the districts to understand that um, families may opt for a private provider setting or may want to, may be eligible for a Head Start setting. And those children are going to come to that school district uh, as kindergartners. So we want to raise the quality across the board um, in, in communities across New Jersey. Well, well, big applause. Can you all hear it for this amazing panel and thank each of you for your contribution. And most importantly, thank you for leading us forward in your states because I think we all feel much better just knowing that there's some states that have such good leadership. So thank you. Now we're gonna move on to our local panel discussion and we have an equally uh, great set of leaders that I'm excited about. So first we have uh, Jocelyn Esteves Vargas. She is the Vice President of Early Childhood Programs for HOPE's um, uh, Community Action Program. That's in New Jersey. And they have, uh, you'll, well, you'll get to hear this. They have a number of Head Start programs and work collaboratively with uh, the school districts. And then we have Sarah Kuyper. 
She is the pre-K coordinator at Nicholas County Schools in West Virginia. So she's there at the local level running things in such a wonderful way. And then we have my good friend from many years, Allison Mullendorf, who's the executive director of Alabama School Readiness Alliance. Uh, this is a great panel and uh, welcome each of you. I have a question and you have three to four minutes to answer it. And uh, it's for everybody. And we'll start with, um, I haven't decided, but I'll start with Allison. And then we'll go to Sarah and then to Jocelyn. You each play a critical role in supporting local implementation of high quality mixed delivery pre-K, although your roles are very different. Share your role at the local level in implementing the pre-K program. What have you learned about ensuring families have access to a range of high quality mixed delivery preschool settings? So Allison. Well, thank you so much, Libby. Uh, I'm Allison Mullendorf, the executive director of the Alabama School Readiness Alliance, and I am on the local panel, but I do actually work statewide. And I'm going to get into the local work that we have encouraged, supported, and expanded over the years and how that influenced state policy. But just a little bit uh, of an answer to that question is that I lead a statewide alliance of four organizations advocating for the expansion of quality pre-K. And over the years, as part of that expansion, as Pamela mentioned, States, the state has increased investments in quality pre-K from 19 to over $170 million. And now we have grown over the last decade from 6% of four-year-olds in Alabama to 45% of four-year-olds. And we do have research through the eighth grade in a longitudinal study that has shown that controlling for school system, demographics, that children that have attended Alabama's first class pre-K program have much higher rates of reading proficiency and math proficiency. They are less likely to need special education services. They're less likely to be held back a grade. They're less likely to be chronically absent. And they're less likely to have serious disciplinary issues. And we also have studies showing the extent of the achievement gap closures in our state. So I just wanted to point that out. Um, the other thing about our role is that as the advocates in our state for high quality pre-K, we have always wanted pre-K for all, but we want it to expand gradually to maintain the high quality, the 10 out of 10 ranking for quality that our state has that has been leading to these results for children and the diverse delivery program. I will never ever advocate for an all public school pre-K program. I grew up with a mom who ran a child care center. So I will always put child care at the table and I will always keep them in mind. And they do need different supports. We know that now that we are looking at everything through an equity lens. When we're looking at diverse delivery, the problem with equity is that the average child care center in Alabama, the level of quality is way far away from what we demand in Alabama first class pre-K program. So we are looking at how to close that gap. Um, but we do have a lot of church-based programs that participate in Alabama's first class pre-K program. Some of our volunteers and advocates have recruited those programs. And for our Latino families, the Catholic Diocese are some of the most trusted programs. And I'll be help, happy to answer questions later about how that works. But in the past, it was all 70% public schools, you know, over the last decade, really, we're really getting the first class pre-K funding, and it would be 30% like private childcare and other university funded sites, YMCAs. And now, in this last grant cycle in Alabama, out of necessity, because we're now at 45% of four-year-olds and public schools are running out of space, we're looking at 30% public schools and 70% private sites. So that's how we're going to do the remainder of our pre-K expansion, and we've got some exciting plans for that. 
Wonderful. I think it's great that you have the local perspective and the state perspective. And I love the research because there's nothing like research to really prove your point. Okay, Sarah, we'd love to hear your answer. Um, good afternoon. I'm Sarah Kuyper, preschool coordinator at Nicholas County Schools. Um, we do have a fully collaborative full day model. Um, we have a universal application process, um, which includes local education agency, um, Head Start and child care as well. Um, we use a point system to rank um, each student, um, each applicant. And then we, based on that point system, they are um, filtered out into sites. Um, and then families can also choose what site might fit their needs. Um, just like has been mentioned, a child might need before care um, and they might uh, thrive from the school environment and then they might need after care. So we provide for that in our universal application process. And that's what we use in our county. That's great. What's well, obviously working. So Jocelyn, you have a very different situation. Tell us about your role. Yes, good afternoon. I'm honored to be part of this panel. Thank you for inviting me to share the perspective from the provider Head Start program perspective. Um, I work for Hope's Cap Inc., uh, a non-for-profit agency located in Hoboken, New Jersey, which collaborates with uh, four different school districts, uh, two of which are former AVID districts that Robin mentioned, uh, part of a legislative uh, ruling, and two are preschool expansion districts. So, and we serve three different uh, counties in New Jersey. We have classrooms that are collaboration classrooms between our Head Start, and uh, districts, local school districts, and we have fully state funded classrooms. So we are both a Head Start provider as well as a child care provider uh, collaborating with districts. Um, we, uh, I have served as the Vice President of Early Childhood Programs for Hope's Cap Inc. and worked with Hope's for the past 22 years. And I am responsible for the development, expansion, and oversight of the programs that includes expectant women and children birth to five years old uh, since we have an early Head Start grant as well as our Head Start grant. Um, we do serve families in three different counties within New Jersey. So we have uh, Union County, Somerset County, and Hudson County currently serving over 1,250 children. Um, and uh, as we go on through our conversation this afternoon, you'll learn more about some of our partnerships and what um, those look like um, throughout our, the state. That's exciting. That's a lot of uh, programs and a lot of kids. Thank you for serving them. So my second question is, once again, this the tailored to each of you individually, and you'll have three minutes to answer. So I'm going to start with Sarah. Um, West Virginia, uh, in West Virginia, tell us about the role of the county collaborative in Nicholas County in ensuring that all children have access to high quality preschool. How does the collaborative coordinate enrollment and allocate funding to providers through joint decision, decision making? Um, like I had mentioned previously, 100% of our programs are fully collaborative um, between Head Start, Child Care, and local education. Um, we do combine all of our funding to maximize the service delivery and continuity for each classroom. Um, we have a blended staffing model, so that might include a teacher who's employed by the local education agency and an assistant who might be employed by Head Start or um, even child care. So we have a mixed blended staffing model, as well as students. We have students that are um, that do fall under the program for local boards of education, and then we also have them um, that fall under Head Start funding. So we've got blended staffing and students. Um, we have a monthly collaboration meeting where all of our stakeholders come together, and that includes the West Virginia DHHR. Um, we even have Save the Children, school health professionals, principal, parent rep, Head Start, child care. Everyone comes to the table monthly for that collaboration, and um, that's called our core team meeting, um, like Janet referenced before. So we have that process in place. And we're able to review um, 
what's going on into classrooms, what might be needed and next steps as to where we can go further. Um, and then also, you know, it is complicated and there are a lot of um, things to talk about and work out. So if, if an agreement cannot be made, we do have an impasse procedure in place for that. So, you know, it doesn't always go um, as planned. So we do have uh, procedures in place. Great, thank you very much. So Allison, your organization, the Alabama School Readiness Alliance has a long history. I remember when it got started. Uh, for access, for advocating for access to high quality pre-K. I know now you have a new program called Bold Goals Coalition. Can you tell us how this is working? Absolutely, thank you, Libby. So the Alabama School Readiness Alliance has always organized local volunteers to help with pre-K implementation. And we still do that to this day, my board chair, just sat down with his church finally and got them interested in opening up empty classrooms to uh, have the Alabama first class pre-K program in the middle of a town where they have a large concentration of students that are very high need. Um, but we started to notice about six years ago that, no, oh, before then, that public schools were really eating up all this funding. They just were so good at writing the grant for Alabama first class pre-K. And some private childcare centers and nonprofits and other places where, that were eligible for funding, they didn't know that they could apply. They didn't think they could apply. They didn't have time to apply. So we've been working in several counties to develop cohorts of Childcare centers for mentoring to understand what first class pre-K is, and we'll have a local organization that just raises a small amount of money to do this. And one of those initiatives, which has had the largest impact in our state at the local level, is Bold Goals. And it's not a project of the Alabama School Readiness Alliance. I am one lowly member of the Bold Goals Early Learning Action Network. And once a month, I participate in their meetings. So Bold Goals incorporates the five counties around our largest population center, Birmingham, Alabama. And what we decided to do about six years ago was take advantage of the fact that our state is increasing pre-K funding every year and connect local child care programs with what they need in a series of trainings and hands-on support through the organizations that were already doing that at the local level, similar to what I know, you know, these other states have mandated. Uh, I would like to see what Bold Goals is doing to be more um, codified, and that's something that we're working on, but the results speak for themselves. So we've had um, about 30 programs just over the last four years, or five years, um, that are private childcare programs, but it's more than 30 classrooms, because some of them have gotten multiple classrooms now get pre-K funding when they didn't think that they could do it. Some of them had to try three years in a row. Some of them had to move walls and get you know, funding from a local philanthropist just to meet the square footage requirements. But it was an everything that it takes mentality and is a collective impact. And it is, it is monitored and led by that local United Way. So I would say tap into your local United Ways work with your local Strive Together initiative, work with your local third grade reading initiative. These collective impact initiatives can do so much to get programs ready for pre-K. And, and now we have this Quality Stars program in Alabama that if we get more time, I'd like to talk more about, which pays providers up to 80 grand a year. And it helps them show the quality it's our quality rating and improvement system. And it, it, they can choose a la carte what they want to choose on the quality rubric rather than it be like, you have to get everything under star one to get star two. No, you just have to get a certain number of points and it is changing the game. And our Department of Early Childhood is finding so many new pre-K providers through our new labor quality stars, but it's gonna take a lot of funding it's going to take a lot of continued advocacy to move this forward. And I really appreciate what Margot said 
in the chat. Quality is equity, equity is quality. There's been a lot of talk over the years, oh, quality rating systems don't reflect the quality of that lady in the basement. <laughs> well, in Alabama, we now do, and it can be done. I love it. The lady in the basement is now offering quality pre-K because of your good efforts, so thank you. So Jocelyn, in your work at, as a large Head Start agency in New Jersey, it sounds like you're really big uh, and been around for a while, you receive state preschool contracts with several school districts of varying sizes, some as small as three classrooms and others as large as 26. What have been the strong points in these relationships and what have been the challenges and how have you addressed the kinks in implementation? How have you built positive relationships with partners, worked to build consensus, reach compromise and develop solutions to expansion of state pre-K? All that in three minutes. Okay, I'll do my best. Thank you. Um, so in terms of strong points, I think um, I want to bring out three. Flexibility, commitment to the mixed delivery system, and communication. In terms of flexibility, um, none of our collaborations look exactly the same. As you mentioned, some are very small, um, three classrooms, and others are very large, 26 classrooms also in the length of time that we've been partnering. So sometimes um, our youngest a partnership is in its first year. So it's in an infancy per, uh, stage with the preschool expansion district. Um, while our longest lasting uh, collaboration has been almost 25 years. So it outlives my tenure at, at HOPES. So that is, is very important to, to know that programs that are willing to to do this kind of partnership have to be flexible. And there has to be flexibility, not only on the part of the provider Head Start program, but also on the parts of the district. For example, we are, um, some of our partnerships are within the school district buildings. So we are in the same buildings as their K to six um, population, which sometimes brings its own set of challenges. And I'll go into some of the challenges um, in a little bit. But those, um, that's one kind of um, setting. We've also are in settings where we provide within our own agency, collaboration classrooms, Head Start only classrooms, as well as early Head Start classrooms. So that is, you know, some differences there. Um, we also have to have flexibility in understanding where districts are and understanding how to merge the requirements of Head Start with uh, state requirements. Some of our collaborating districts have a, a deep knowledge and understanding of what Head Start regulations are and are you know, willing to take on the partnership knowing what they're stepping into. Others have a larger learning curve. So being flexible uh, in working with districts that uh, have a history and a knowledge of Head Start and others that don't. Um, I think the second important thing is, like I said, commitment to having a mixed delivery system, knowing that not every program is going to look exactly the same, some in childcare settings, some in public schools, um, some in smaller buildings, some in larger buildings. I think that having the right disposition and having the commitment from the district's part, point of view, as well as our agency has been, you know, a great um, launching point to make uh, having the programs be a success. And lastly, but not least in terms of strong points is communication. I think that is one of the most crucial things uh, in any partnership and is really led to the success of our, our partnerships. You know, we have to be able to discuss things like per pupil costs, curriculum implementation, assessment tools, data sharing, staff professional development, coaching and mentoring, evaluations of the staff, teacher pay, equity and pay, uh, daily schedules, and even the yearly calendar. So every topic needs to be able to be discussed in an open and respectful you know, manner. Um, I think an important takeaway from our experience thus far is that communication needs to be ongoing, frequent, and willing to take on any challenges at any point of that partnership. In terms of the challenges, the biggest challenges uh, we found is, is within the funding, making sure that we find that right formula that uh, provides a per pupil allocation to the Head Start programs and childcare partners that truly supports uh, parity and pay or at least comparable wages for um, staff at all levels, not just the teachers, but TAs, family advocates and other support staff to the program. 
and being able to uh, make sure that the that the district understands that um, that the providers are part of the district and should be part of any district or statewide initiatives that can support um, staff development, like alternate credentialing um, programs for teachers, support through scholarships and um, ongoing professional development. Another challenge is a stability of location. You know, sometimes when you are in school buildings, the pre-K programs get shuffled around um, because of their growing population in the K to six population or K to eight, depending on which um, district uh, building you're in. Also knowing that districts need to understand that if a provider or a Head Start program is leasing or mortgaging a facility, rent still needs to be paid on the other months when the program is not in operation and there are costs that are you know, standard. And so a lot of issues um, or most of the challenges are around funding and sustainability of the program. I think the last part of uh, your question was about sustaining those positive relationships. And I think that what I can say from our experience is dedicating the time. You need to put the work in to plan together, to build those partnerships, to be um, a, you know, able to really go through the conversation of what the program will look like together and plan it together, being able to write a proposal. In the case of the state of New Jersey, we have to write a proposal to DOE to be able to obtain the funding to uh, establish those partnerships. So I think it's every step of the way requires that dedication and time um, and putting in the work to make it work. Uh, but also the willingness to problem solve and find consensus together and find practices, policies, and procedures that are a win-win, a win for the district, a win for the provider or Head Start program, and most importantly, a win for families and children in New Jersey. Excellent. Excellent. You did a wonderful job. So now it's time for us to hear uh, questions from our audience. And we have one here. And Sarah, it's directed to you, but I'd also love Allison to comment on it. So it's how have you ensured early learning, the early learning community and families particularly understand what a mixed delivery system is and what their options are? Um, we host several school readiness events in our county. And so that gives families the opportunity to come out and get a little snapshot of what we offer and what's available for their children. And I think that, um, that helps them understand um, the programs that we have to offer. Great. And Allison, how are you all doing in Alabama? We don't have the answer so far. You know, we do have a universal registration website, which uh, was only launched in the last couple of years, and that has gone a long way. And the programs in Alabama First Class Pre-K are required to advertise. They have to use some of their budget to advertise. And diverse delivery just makes it easier to reach families in their own neighborhood. Great. So we have another question, and it's what mechanisms are used to help align early childhood education to K-3 so that the systems don't remain sliced or siloed? I'm sorry, siloed. So how, how are you aligning things? And, and actually, let's start with Jocelyn, because it might be harder since you're not in the school district. I know it might be easier for Sarah, but what about you, Jocelyn? How are you all aligning with K-12 or K K-3? I, again, that comes to the relationships and communication. We are, uh, as providers uh, and Head Start programs that collaborate with districts, um, having ongoing meetings to discuss transitions to kindergarten, how the curriculum aligns with what's happening in kindergarten, what are the expectations for children when they enter kindergarten uh, once they leave our program. So I think those conversations are important. Also, what portfolio information we provide to the kindergarten teacher from the pre-K teacher of pre-K four teachers to see uh, where the, what the children learn, what it, where are they at, and um, what conversations have ha been had with families in order to continue that learning at home. So I think that all of that goes together and um, really um, strengthen that transition um, and also builds um, kind of like a partnership between the teachers. So the pre-K teacher is communicating uh, what she has seen um, or the teams have seen, the pre-K three and pre-K four teams have seen with the kindergarten teachers and beyond. So um, most of our districts have really um, strengthened that 
transition process and the communication that happens so that information um, that is shared really benefits the families. So Sarah, it's probably easier for you, but I'd love to hear you comment on it. How are you all making sure there's a seamless system? Um, we do have a kindergarten transition, or excuse me, preschool kindergarten transition day. Um, and we hold that and the students will actually move up and spend the day in a kindergarten classroom and um, they get to kind of, you know, run through what a typical day would look like and maybe they're coming from childcare or they're um, in one of the collaborative classrooms that we have that are in the school. Um, so they're coming from various sites and they're going to the school, they're going to get the day of, of you know, how how it would go actually in the classroom. So they get that piece. And then the teachers also meet separately. So the preschool teachers and the kindergarten teachers meet and they go over um, individual ch um, child transition reports. So they get that information um, from the previous teacher going to the kindergarten teacher. And we make that connection there. Allison, I'd love to hear what you all are doing as well. I mean, how how are you you have research to show kids are doing well but is are the when the kids get to kindergarten are the kindergarten teachers happy to get these kids or are they like oh you haven't taught them the right stuff well generally the kindergarten teachers are thrilled to get the children who have had pre-k especially as more and more have them but yeah we still have a long way to go in terms of ensuring that what's taught in kindergarten through third grade is meeting children where they are and it's developmentally appropriate for how young children learn. And Alabama does have a wonderful uh, new-ish program called the Pre-K to Third Grade Developmental Approach to Early Learning. And I, you know, Dr. True Love Walker, who's on this uh, panel, the previous panel can probably share uh, how many school systems are now participating in that. It's a small pilot like our pre-K program used to be. Uh, it's truly phenomenal and it was developed with that National uh, Elementary Principals Association. Can't remember the official name of that group, but uh, it is fantastic and it's really changing the way that educators are collaborating and looking at the kids that are coming to them as young children, as good children, as good inside, and maybe just five and six, really, you know, and, and not really able to do some of the things that they may be expecting them to do. But the play leads to the outcomes in the long run, as we all know. Okay, we only have a minute or two left, but I'd love to hear one of you talk about this because this is my passion. What about our kids with IEPs that are in special ed? Are they over in their own classroom or are they integrated in? And if so, how are you doing that? So who wants to take it on? Okay, Jocelyn. I can start. Yeah, absolutely. All of our classrooms are inclusive. We really uh, strive and make extra efforts to reach, you know, hard to reach population, not only children with special needs, but also homeless families, newly immigrant families, um, families that are obviously low income. We provide a lot of, of outreach for families that are really have a harder time accessing, uh, you know, education overall. So it our efforts are totally focused on um, making sure that everyone feels like they can be part of something wonderful, like universal pre-k right allison i know you wanted to say something you have to be fast so we just want to be like jocelyn's agency uh, alabama's pre-k is inclusive that's something that our state has worked on over the years with special education preschool to really combine blend and braid and have the children you know out of their standalone classrooms and sprinkled into our first class pre-k with the supports that they need great well, kudos. I wish I had confetti to drop in the uh, the screen because you all were awesome. Thank you so much for the great presentations, but most importantly, what you're doing there in your state to assure that what's happening at the state level is really working down to the local level and most of all benefiting kids and families. So thank you. Uh, we're going to the last part of our program, but not the least. I'm so excited to get to introduce Barbara Chow. She is a rock star. She is the Director of Education Programs at the Heising Simons Foundation, and she's in philanthropy, and you think, oh, she's over in philanthropy, she's giving out money, and that's what she's thinking about, but you know, she has an incredible policy background and used to work at the Domestic Policy Council. She was Associate Director for Education, Income, Maintenance, and Labor Programs at the Office of Management and Budget, and a Special Assistant 
to the president for the White House Legislative Affairs. So she knows policy, and we're so fortunate to have her do our wrap up. So Barbara, welcome and thank you. Thank you, Libby. That was lovely. And this has just been a, an amazing webinar, I will say. The panelists, I want to congratulate the panelists. I've learned so much. And um, near in Learning Policy Institute for this very, very excellent policy brief. I've been kind of watching the um, chat back and forth, and I can see there's intense interest in these in the details, really, of how these um, programs work. And so I, I think it's just been phenomenal. So I have the sort of happy task of just trying to pull some things together. And I have um, five observations that I'm going to share with you. The perspective I take is that of a, I would say, recovering policy person. Um, and I'm currently an early childhood funder in California, which is about to implement the country's largest and probably most complex universal pre-K program. And so for us, and I see a lot of Californians are in this group, learning from others is really essential. And so this has been very, very helpful already. But there are kind of five things I think I would start with. Um, one, policy is a blunt tool that must be wielded with precision. Uh, when I used to work in on legislation years ago, as Libby said, there was this lovely practice where you would receive what's called a red line, which is a, the first embossed page of a bill and the pen used to sign the legislation you had been working on. I was fortunate to receive a bunch of these when I worked uh, at the White House. And I remember that really joyful feeling of, of accomplishment, of being done when the legislation was signed. But of course, in retrospect, that was both arrogant and naive as signing a bill only signals the beginning of something as complex as changing the education system. And there's so many ways in which the good ideas captured in the legislative text can end up with unanticipated and even harmful consequences. So I think that kind of leads me, and, and we saw some of this reflected in the panel to the um, sort of the question of like, what is the policy role, particularly the legislative policy role? I think there are kind of two core goals, two, two core roles. One is budget. The system has to be well financed and, and to support high levels of compensation and benefits commensurate with qualifications. Early childhood education, as everybody has said here, is complex, delicate, and skilled and should be paid accordingly. Labor costs represent the vast majority of pre-K expenditures, which means it's an expensive ende endeavor and it requires significant public investment. And the second, I think, policy role is that of quality. All the systems that you know you saw here and described in the in the uh, research report emphasize the importance of uh, highly qualified, well-supported teachers, and maintaining comparable standards across all system elements, from schools to community centers or, or family care. I like to think of this as every choice should be a good choice goal, and I think that's a an, a, an important policy goal. Beyond these two non-negotiables, adequate budget and quality markers, there's lots of other very good to have objectives that might be best left to a broad statement of aspiration, guidance or implementation, and a reliance on a kind of a system of continuous improvement. For example, the West Virginia, I, I thought that was so interesting that the importance of collaboration, I think, between uh, school districts and kind of the private, um, child care and Head Start system is really critical. And I, as I understand it, the initial legislation wanted to kind of lift that up and specify that there should be this kind of collaboration. But that actual decision around what the amount should be, the 50% um, kind of came about as a result of this um, more consultative practice. So what, what that meant, I think, is that the um, it's, it's really important to have practice informed policy rather than sort of policy that dictates or mandates something, even if it's a good thing, before we kind of really know what that level ought to be. They also gave 10 years for that to occur. And I think the result of that is, you know, you, you saw that there's a very high level of collaboration, 82%, and only um, that was only absent when it's not really possible to, to have that kind of level of, co of collaboration because of the childcare deserts. So that's kind of point number one is what's the role of policy? The second is, I think a really obvious one, which is many, many roads lead to Rome. It's really clear from the descriptions of all these different 
geographies and political contexts and sizes of states, that there are lots of ways of getting to a high quality system. The near LPI recommendations present an essential checklist of considerations that states should think through while constructing new systems, but you'll note they don't recommend one path. That's because each state and context is different and should be decided really by those closest to the ground. Third, meet people where they are. I'm really fond of that old adage, change happens at the speed of trust. Universal pre-K is exciting, it's important, and it's disruptive. It can upend the business model of many home or center-based providers. It adds a layer of complexity to school leaders and teachers who may have little experience with this age group. Building relationships and trust over time is essential to the successful rollout of universal pre-K. This is one of those very ephemeral, very hard to measure goals, but I am convinced it is an integral part of the success equation. Four, all politics are local. Of course, state agencies play a critical role in setting the system's broad framework, budget, and goals. But as I think you heard today, in most cases, implementation is really occurring at the local level. Certainly, this will be the case in the state as big as California with a strong local control ethos. This means that the local governing councils, and you, you heard some examples of that, should be inclusive in regular dialogue with state counterparts and recognized as foundational for pre-K systems. Virgi West Virginia's collaboration model might serve as a strong example of how to blend state goals with local action. And last, the best, it can be done. High quality mixed delivery state pre-K systems are possible if given enough intentionality money, and time. And I'll end with that thought. Thank you. Thank you so much, Barbara, for those insightful comments. Um, with that, I would just like to remind everyone that you can learn much more about the states that we have featured as well as um, others in uh, the NEAR and LPI briefing report that were shared in the chat, and you can find them on our websites. Um, I want to extend a huge thank you to everyone who is involved in today's inspiring conversation, um, to our wonderful panelists, first and foremost, to Libby Doggett, to Karen Garver. Um, we thank our co-hosts, the National Institute for Early Education Research, um, for their leadership in this study, and uh, to our amazing co-sponsors, CCSSO, NASLI, NASB, and NCSL. Um, finally, thank you to the Heising Simons Foundation, the Balmer Group, and the Packard Foundation for supporting this webinar and the research. Before we uh, leave today, we'd really encourage you to fill out the survey in the chat. Please let us know what went well, what you'd like to learn more about, and how we can improve. Um, thank you so much, and have a great day. And I also just want to um, answer the chat that this um, webinar was recorded and will be available um, in a few days. I hope you all have a wonderful afternoon. Mm -hmm.